the twelfth Sunday after Trinity. Almighty and everlasting God, who art always ready more to hear than we to pray, and are wont to give more than either we desire or deserve, pour down upon us the abundance of thy mercy, forgiving us those things whereof our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things of which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now for Ascension Day, hymn 215, verse 2. He who on the cross did suffer, he who from the grave arose, he has vanquished sin and Satan, he by death has spoiled his foes, while he lifts his hands in blessing, he is parted from his friends, while their eager eyes behold him, he upon the cloud ascends. Well, we turn our attention to Dr. Walter Brugman. Old Testament theology consisting of about 381 pages and then the notes to the pages But with the scripture index comes down to about 433 pages. We're on page 89, and we'll say so far we are not impressed. There's a good dose of enthusiasm um, at times for the scribe, a lack of calm deliberativeness. Problem in maybe judicial temperament, but we're still assessing it. Maybe a little bit of Bart Bardian enthusiasm. Even here and there, bolt manium Colonel Husk's thinking. But we move on here to chapter 6 on Yahweh as sovereign in metaphor. From these primal narratives, there's his favorite term, primal, of self-disclosure, Israel learns approach to Yahweh is dangerous and at times requires care. Exodus 35, 19, 10 through 13. That Yahweh will not be seen. Exodus 33, 20. And that Yahweh is free to act without an obligation according to Yahweh's own inclination. And we might notice here there's very there was nothing in canon. In a text on theology, there's nothing on the documentary hypothesis. Now, maybe argued that it's in his Old Testament intro. The text make clear that Yahweh is hidden and inscrutable beyond domestication into any of Israel's categories. For that reason, there can be no images of Yahweh, Exodus 20, 4 through 6, Deuteronomy 4, 15 to 20. And even attempts to describe Yahweh verbally are hazardous and sure to be inexact. I don't know where he gets that, but as we were given our little baby words to understand him, and they're true even though they're baby words. The result is that Israel's characteristic speech concerning Yahweh expressed in song, oracles, and narrative is according to the image and metaphor that proceed playfully and imaginatively without any claim to being descriptive. Oh, please, Wally. Oh, I so did. How does he write this as a theologian? So we're going to have a lot of objections and our progress will be slow. But at best, Israel's speech concerning Yahweh is elusive and suggestive, therefore congruent with the most intense encounters with Yahweh that Israel is permitted. 
the field of metaphors. And why doesn't he say the field of words? Words are metaphors for reality. Through which Israel gives testimony to Yahweh is rich, varied, and complex. But all speech seeks to articulate this God who is sovereign in relationship. From that rich, varied, and complex field of discourse, I will mention four of the dominant metaphors used by Israel to articulate Yahweh, each of which makes a claim for Yahweh but makes a claim even while it concedes that the claim is inadequate to the reality of Yahweh. Well, number one, in the Exodus narrative, Israel articulates Yahweh as the divine warrior who forcefully participates in combat with the armies of Pharaoh in order that Yahweh may yet get the glory in order that the Israelites leave bondage. We may identify four accents in Israel's appeal to Yahweh as a warrior and then reflect on the claim of the metaphor. The Exodus narrative requires an agency of ferocious power to overcome the might and resolve of Pharaoh. It is Israel's attestation that the Exodus departure is not made possible through human agency, even though Moses is prominent in the narrative. <clears throat> the claim of the Exodus narrative is that Yahweh, who fights for Israel and defeats the state power of Pharaoh, Exodus 14, 13, and 14, and 25, but Moses said to the people, do not be afraid and stir, stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to keep still. Yahweh clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty the Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. There's no doubt that military imagery is in intimately connected to the mythic imagery of creation and chaos. The warrior God also manages and manipulates the waters of the sea. Exodus 14, 27 to 29. And by the way, I do like the fact that he quotes the Bible, puts it in indentation. It's very readable and accessible. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained, but the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on the right and on the left. Israel's earliest songs attest that Yahweh is a man of war, Exodus 15, 3. <clears throat> Miriam sings the triumph of Yahweh over Pharaoh. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider, he is thrown into the sea. Exodus 15, 21. The song of Moses, moreover, celebrates the dramatic feat of Pharaoh because of the overwhelming power of Yahweh. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he cast into the sea. He picked officers who were sunk in the Red Sea. This is Exodus 15, 4 to 10. The floods cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. 
your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrew your adversaries. You sent out your fury. It consumed them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The flood stood up in heat. The deep congealed in the heart of the sea. The Lord said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fulfill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty wars. The Exodus imagery pervades the Bible, stretching the capacity of Yahweh from historic enemies to cosmic spiritual enemies that in the New Testament makes us more than conquerors. Romans 8, 37. The mighty capacity of Yahweh in the Exodus is in the Song of Moses, extended to the conquest of the land of promise. Exodus 15, 14 through 16. The peoples heard, they trembled. Pangs besieged the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. Trembling sieged the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan melted away. Terror and dread fell upon them. With the might of your arm, they became still as a stone until your people, O Lord, pass by, until the people whom you acquired passed by. The lyrical affirmation behind the narrative of land seizure in the book of Joshua. Joshua 10 through 12. The seizure of the land of Canaan is massive and brutal. In contrast to the Exodus narrative, the conquest narrative allows much more credit to human agents as Joshua and his army are seen to be effective agents in the destruction of the resident population. Joshua 12:7. The following are the kings of the land, or Joshua the Israelites, defeated on the west side of the Jordan, from Baal God in the valley of Lebanon to Mount Halak that rises towards Seir, and gave the land to the tribes of Israel as a possession according to their allotments. Nonetheless, there can be no doubt that the whole of the narrative Yahweh as the leader of the army of Joshua and the legitimator of the brutality enacted against the indigenous population. Indeed, it is possible to see the conquest as a twin event that reenacts the exodus in the new venue, both times featuring Yahweh as the aggressive perpetrator of the new order. The twinning of the two events that feature Yahweh as warrior is evident in the as of the theologically self-conscious statement of Joshua, Joshua 4, 23 and 24. <clears throat> for the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan for you until you crossed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we crossed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, and so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. It is clear that the land is taken by violent force, a violence that is, according to the text, at the behest of the warrior God of Exodus. Now we're on the third bullet, and this has got bullets, and I think he said there would be four bullets. I wish she had to put the numbering in, but he didn't. 
The treasured traditions of Israel are agreed that Yahweh fights for Israel, Yahweh's chosen people, and treasured possession. It is equally clear, however, in the subsequent witness of the prophets, that the military capacity of Yahweh is also turned against Israel when Israel is judged and punished by covenantal sanctions for the violation of the covenant Torah. In prophetic discourse, Yahweh, the enforcer, enforces covenant sanctions most vigorously against Israel. By and large, prophetic themes of judgment allow that military threat against Israel is ident by identifiable military agents, more especially the Assyrians, Isaiah 10, 5 through 6, and most decisively by the barbarians, Jeremiah 25, 6, 27, 6. In such prophetic discourse, however, it is clear that human perpetrators of military violence act at the initiative of Yahweh, who dispatches such armies. At the same time, prophetic, rhetor prophetic rhetorical can speak as though Yahweh is the direct military agent. Thus, in Jeremiah 21.4, the prophet anticipates the coming of the Babylonians but then in verse 5, presents Yahweh as the direct actor in the military threat. Jeremiah 21.5 says, I myself will fight against you with outstretched hand and mighty arm, in anger, in fury, and in great wrath. In that declaration, moreover, the rhetoric echoes exactly phrasing of Exodus language so that the God who in Exodus fights for Israel is now the God who fights against Israel. And in the telling of the normative story of ancient Israel, it is Yahweh via the Babylonians who brings the holy city to devastating termination. Bullet point four we might anticipate that such an inversion of the metaphor of divine warrior would lead to the culmination of the image. The God who fights for now fights against to the finish. Most remarkably, however, the metaphor survives the crisis of the destruction of the city and resurfaces in the subsequent literature to assert again that Yahweh will fight for Israel. Subsequent exilic literature, Isaiah 40, verse 10. So he obviously believes in Deutero or Trito, Trito, Isaiah, as he puts in the exilic period. That'll please the dissectionists. Yahweh is again the mighty warrior on behalf of Israel. In Isaiah 40, 26, Yahweh marshals the stars to fight as the heavenly armies. Above all, in Isaiah 43, 16 to 17, the new thing that replicates and displaces the old exodus will be done by Yahweh with military effectiveness. Isaiah 43, 16 through 17. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. The old claim of Yahweh as warrior provides a rhetoric of hope in the 6th century, even after the divine warrior has decisively assaulted the pro-chosen people. There's no doubt that the imagery of divine warrior is problematic for biblical faith. 
as we become increasingly aware that the Bible is permeated with violence in which Yahweh is deeply enmeshed. G. Ernest Wright, in quite an old-fashioned way, has indicated why this imagery is critical, crucial for faith. It is essential to have a God of power who is known to act decisively against the strong power of evil. Since the time of Wright's presentation, however, we are, of course, much more aware of the ways in which such imagery is a huge liability, for it serves willy-nilly to authorize and legitimate all sorts of military adventurism in the name of God. Wow. Just wow. Nowhere do we see any nuancing with righteousness, justice, holiness, divine infallibility, divine inspiration. willy-nilly military adventurism in the name of God. <clears throat> and of course, at this point in time, the United States' propensity to use such imagery as theological justification for military adventurism is immense. Give me a break. Walter Brugman. Holy Week, 2007. Regina Swartz, in her programmatic analysis of violence in the Bible, has seen the Exodus conquest traditions and the recurring premise of the warrior God as enduringly problematic in biblical faith. Wright has seen that a God of power is indispensable and faith. It follows in the text and seemingly for right that such power of necessity comes as violence. Schwartz shows that the afterlife of the text of violence featuring the warrior God has provided the rationale for many subsequent acts of political violence. Here's a quote from her. In the end, whether the people who generated the myth were empowered or disempowered and making ethics contingent upon power makes a mockery of ethics as an independent court of judgment. Whether they were conquerors or oppressed victims seeking liberation, they have bequeathed a myth to future generations that is ethically problematic at best, a myth that advocates the wholesale annihilation of indigenous peoples to take their land. There are, of course, interpretive strategies that can lessen the toxin of these traditions. Biblical theologians, however, must take care not to explain away what is so definitional definitional for the textual tradition. This imagery is something that we must live with, albeit with awkwardness and embarrassment. We might wish for another, better theological tradition. This, however, is the one we have. The presentation of this God is not marginal to the Bible, nor can it be justified simply as a human projection among the disinherited, nor can it be easily resolved by a developmental hypothesis, the preferred strategy of the Old, Te of Old Testament scholarship. It is there. Self-critical reflection requires, of course, critique of the very God whom Jews and Christians confess. While we make our awkward, self-aware confession, 
we cannot fail to notice, even among us, the ways in which the theological tradition continues to fund what we rightly abhor. So, Dr. Brueggemann is embarrassed by God, the judge of the nations. Ascension Hymn 215, verse 3. Thou hast raised our human nature on the clouds to God's right hand. There we sit in heavenly places. There with thee in glory stand. Jesus reigns, adored by angels. Man with God is on the throne. Mighty Lord, in thine ascension, behold our own. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in this, was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed. Experience Boost help you. I raised my foot 13 points in Experience Boost. I raised it 17. It's not a competition. Bye.